Hey guys, welcome to or welcome back to my channel, Knee Knits. My name is Amy and we talk about all things knitting here on this YouTube channel. And today's episode is a knit and chat Q&A themed. Hey guys, thank you for tuning in. My name is Amy and today we are doing a knit and chat. This is my first knit and chat. So I have my project here to work on. This is the Monday sweater by Petite Knit. I am on the body. We are just doing straight stocking it in the round. So I thought it was the perfect project to use for today's knit and chat. I asked you guys both on YouTube here and on Instagram for any questions you guys may have for me. Uh, maybe just to get to know me better or questions about knitting and I'm here to answer all of those today in celebration of reaching 5,000 subscribers which thank you guys so much for subscribing to my channel and liking my videos it really means a lot I definitely didn't expect to reach this milestone so quickly so just thank you guys for joining in and being part of this so I did put a little stitch marker where I am starting to knit I have no idea how long this chat is going to be. I compiled all of the questions here, so I'm going to go through them. It looks like there is, there are 23 questions. I don't really see myself as like a chatty person, but I don't know, 23 questions, there's definitely a lot to go into. So we will get into it. All right, so we'll get into the first question and I'm just going to keep my notes over here. So if I'm looking over here, I'm just trying to read. <laughs> the first question is, what does NE stand for in knee knits? And that's a great question, and I have not answered that before on this channel, so I'm glad that someone asked. The NE actually stands for, kind of unofficially, New England. So when I was first coming up with the name for my Instagram and sort of like knitting name, I was more focused on my Etsy shop at the time. I sort of started this whole knitting journey Instagram thing as an Etsy shop. I was trying to sell hats and I wanted to be New England Knits because I've grown up here in New England my whole life and I think it's pretty synonymous like the cold winters here and cozy knits, specifically cozy knit hats that I was selling. So I wanted to be New England Knits. I also liked the alliteration of the N sounds in knitting in New England and with the Etsy shops, obviously you can only have one name. You can have only one shop with a specific name and I think New England Knits was already taken so the NE Knits was not and there was born NE Knits. So I guess the correct pronunciation of the name would be NE since it's an acronym but I just find it easier to say knee knits. It just rolls off the tongue easier. So whether you say N-E knits or knee knits, they're both correct in my mind. And yeah, that's where the name came from. Okay, the next question is, what knitted piece am I the most proud of? And I think that was a well-timed question because I actually just finished my Moby sweater like two or three days ago. And that's definitely at the top of my list of my most proud knits. It was just, I knew it was going to be sort of a challenge and with all of the different cable work and the mock cables and reading charts and yeah, I'm pretty used to knitting pretty straight stockinette pieces, so not a lot going on necessarily there. The Moby sweater had a lot of texture going on, something newer for me, so now that I'm done with it, I love the way it fits. I'm going to talk about it in my next podcast in extreme detail, but definitely the most proud of that knit. If I were to answer that question before I finish the Moby sweater just this week, I think I might say the um, polo sweater because it's just a versatile piece. It's really easy to wear and it doesn't really look hand knit. It's one of those things that I can wear and I don't think people ask me if I made it just because it looks like it could have been purchased at a store. And I think that's something that I'm proud of with my knits if they look professional and not too like crafty. Like I like my knits to look pretty professional so I would say the polo sweater that I made last year would fall into that category. And that also leads into the next question I have, which is what piece do I wear the most? And I do wear my polo sweater probably the most. I haven't kept track of how often I wear it. I know some knitters are getting into sort of tracking how many times they wear their knits, which I think is awesome. I just don't have the <laughs> discipline to do that. 
and have statistics for you guys, but I definitely throw that on a lot. I think it's a mixture of not only the style of the sweater, you know, it's a very classic clean sweater, but also the fabric. It's a DK weight superwash wool without any mohair, so I find it just easy to throw on with any pair of pants. It can be dressed up, it can be dressed down, and it's a neutral brown color, which also adds to the versatility of the piece. I also wear this sweater that I'm wearing today a lot. This is my sweater number nine. The pattern is by My Favorite Things Knitwear. I knit this, I think two years ago, with Knitting for All of Heavy Merino and Soft Silk Mohair held together. And again, I think it's just the shape of the piece. It's very basic combined with a basic color. Like this is just a neutral gray. So I find myself reaching for this a lot. It pairs with a lot of pairs of pants. It's very, you know, it's got a lot of ease, pretty oversized. So pretty cozy and easy to wear. Also, sorry, I might've been holding my knitting like below the camera view frame. So I will try to keep it up for you guys so you can see. This question here, who are your favorite niche knitting designers? Not as popular as Petite Knit, My Favorite Things Knitwear, etc. I thought that was a great question. I am definitely trying to expand my designer repertoire of whose patterns I make. Um, to answer this question, I don't know if these designers are considered niche because I know they are also very popular, but maybe not in the sense as, as big as Petite Knit or My Favorite Things. I really like Kadri and Ozetta, they both make really nice staple patterns that are, um, you know, they have the same sort of simplistic but classy silhouettes that I like. And yeah, I think they're both really good designers. I also really like the Knit Pearl Girl. She has an amazing library of patterns and I think it's been really cool to see her as a designer grow. Like I think she was one of the first designers that I really followed when I first started knitting back in, when I first started knitting garments back in 2020. Um, in fact, her pattern, the Aosta Chunky Sweater, or the Aosta Sweater Chunky Edition was the first sweater that I ever knit. And she's definitely expanded her skill set and pattern writing skills since then. She's released a whole array of very sophisticated and classy looking patterns. And yeah, I think she's really cool. <laughs> Um, let's see, other people that I wrote down. I think Gregoria Fibers has a lot of nice patterns as well. I do have a shawl coming up that I haven't started yet. I wanna finish a few more projects before I cast it on, but I want to make her Barbara shawl and I think she has a lot of great designs. I also follow Coco Amore Knitwear on Instagram. Again, I don't know if they're considered niche. All these designers I'm naming do have like several thousand followers on Instagram, so. Um, but I haven't knit any of Coco Amore's patterns. I really like how they look. I think they are very classy, clean, just sort of fits my aesthetic of what I like to knit. I also really like Caitlin Barthold. She goes by Originally Lovely and she has a blog and she has a lot of free patterns on that blog, including the polo sweater that I mentioned earlier. That's one of her designs. And she does both knit and crochet and I think her pieces are really pretty. And they're usually knit with um, Lion Brand yarn. I think she's like a partner with Lion Brand. So a lot of her patterns use their yarns, which I find are pretty accessible here in the US. They're pretty budget friendly. You can get them at stores like Joanne Fabrics and stuff pretty easily. So great designer there. I wonder if you can hear the clicking of the needles in the video. Okay, next question. How old are you? I am 25. <laughs> Not much more to say about that. I'll be 26 sometime later this year. So I'm on the latter end of 25. What do I do for my main job? So I am an engineer. I have an undergrad degree in engineering and I have a master's degree in engineering management. So right now I work for a pretty large company in their sort of quality areas. So I do a lot of product line management in terms of quality and working with customers that already have our product and you know fixing any technical issues that they may encounter while using our product and yeah I can't really say much more than that. I do work mostly remote so pretty much all of my work is done from home which is really convenient for you know time flexibility and scheduling. I also don't have to commute to the office so it gives me some extra time in the day to 
do things like knit and yeah, I really love my job. I am really happy where I am, so I'll probably be in the same job for a while, which I think is good. Not a lot of people have that, so I'm grateful that I'm enjoying what I'm doing. <laughs> Do you have any advice for people wanting to start more advanced knitting, like color work, cables, etc.? So I would say just go for it. Maybe a few tips is you want to find a pattern that you know is pushing you out of your comfort zone, but you don't want to pick a pattern that's crazy. Like I think people can use their own judgment in knowing what's going to be like the next step for them versus something that's just like an unattainable project at this point in time. It is very helpful to read, you know, the pattern descriptions before you buy it. Most pattern designers will write the skills needed or like the skills involved in the pattern um, in the description before you buy it. So you can read that through and assess maybe if like every bullet point of skills in the pattern is new to you, maybe that's not the right pattern, but if maybe half the bullets or less than half the bullets are new skills, that could be a great um, sign that that's a good project to try. I would also maybe recommend if you're looking for a pattern with um, like cables or color work that you haven't done before, maybe pick a pattern designer that you've knit one of their patterns before so you're familiar with their writing style, their layout of how the pattern is written. So while you're working through the more complex pieces of the pattern, you're not also learning how to read their pattern. So choosing a familiar designer might help with that as well. But yeah, I would say just go for it. Um, the worst that can happen is you have to rip back and start over, but that's part of knitting. And I think a lot of knitting makes more sense as you do it. So you just have to give it a try, get it on your needles and go. YouTube is an awesome resource. Um, I find if I'm going through a pattern and there's a step that I'm not familiar with, I just Google or YouTube search for the skill and I find, you know, the cleanest looking tutorial video and I work through the video while I'm working on the project and then move on. And then sometimes I remember it, sometimes I don't. So if I have to do that thing again, I'll have to pull up the video again, but YouTube is an excellent resource. All right, so I got a couple questions on my video recording setup, so happy to share some details on that. So I record all of my videos on my iPhone. I have an iPhone 13 Pro, so I use the back-facing camera. I have like a cheap little Amazon tripod that I use to prop it up. It's honestly not the best tripod, probably could use an upgrade, but it works. And yeah, I record the video on my iPhone. I record in 1080p. My iPhone does have a 4K recording option as well as like a cinematic option. I just use the plain video. I did use 4K for a shorter video, but for the longer videos, I use the 1080p setting. It just takes up less space and is, yeah, space <laughs> like gigabytes of storage is in short supply on my iPhone and computer. So. so I do also record with a separate microphone. I use the Shure SM57. It has a little foam pop filter on it. And this microphone was actually my husband's. Before we got married, he had it. His main hobby is music. Like he plays guitar and the drums and he's been getting into music recording and mixing. So he actually bought this microphone for you know that hobby and that stuff. And and when I started recording podcasts, he was like, oh, you definitely should use my microphone. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So we record through an interface. It goes into my laptop. And then he taught me how to clean up the audio a little bit just to make it a little bit more crisp, make sure there's no like loud pops in the mic and stuff like that. Um, if he didn't have the microphone beforehand or didn't know how to record or edit audio. I honestly would probably just be recording through my iPhone speakers. I think they're good enough. I like how my recording system is pretty like bare bones. Like there's always room to upgrade, but I'm kind of just using what I got and it's working, which is nice. I'm trying to keep production costs like pretty minimal. I edit on iMovie, which is free on my MacBook. I think it's also free if you have an iPhone and iPad. So yeah, that's my setup. I film directly in front of like a window. So like I'm looking at the camera, but right behind the camera is a window. I always try to maximize natural light as much as possible. Um, so yeah, that's why I film in this room. It's the sunniest room in the apartment. So 
yeah, that's how I do my video recording and editing. <laughs> the next question, would you ever think of making your own patterns? That's a great question. I have in the past, and the short answer is no. At this point in time, I don't really have any interest in being a knitwear designer. I don't really like when knitting becomes like work and when it becomes difficult and the designing process is very difficult. It's a constant like, you knit something, you undo it, you redo it. I don't like redoing things or undoing things. I like sitting down with a knitting project and just working on it and knowing that it's going to work out. So for me, that's just following pre-made patterns. And yeah, I just don't wanna tink around with knitted pieces. <laughs> yeah, I just don't have any interest in making something that might not work out well. And I also don't really have any creative inspiration to design something right now. I feel like if there's something that I want in a knit piece, I've 10 times out of 10 found it in an already existing pattern. And that might just be because my taste is pretty simplistic and I like basic pieces, but yeah, I don't feel like taking the time and the energy to sit down and work through a pattern that doesn't exist. I just like working through existing patterns. I did have an interest maybe like a while ago. I tried to design like a little tank top. It didn't really work out. I didn't really feel like picking it back up again. I just don't have really have like a passion behind it. I also, I think my old interests in it were kind of financially motivated. Like I was thinking like, oh, it must be so easy to have like passive income from knitting patterns. Like you could just do nothing all weekend and make a couple hundred dollars if you sell a couple hundred patterns online, but it's not easy money. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort and time and mental capacity to create a pattern. And I don't want to be a designer if my only motivation is money. So yeah, not in the cards right now. I will leave the designing up to those who feel passionate about it. For me, it's not the time. <laughs> Next question, how did you meet your husband? Yeah, so my husband Nick and I met in college. We both went to engineering school in upstate New York together. We were actually friends for a little bit before we started dating, so we knew each other for a while before we started dating. And yeah, I graduated before him. I got a job here in Massachusetts and he graduated after me, but he also got a job in Massachusetts, which was awesome for us. So yeah, we just got married this past summer and it's been great. I love knitting things for him. I He's very supportive of everything I do knitting related and <laughs> he lives with piles of yarn and projects everywhere. I tend to get very scattered when I have multiple projects going on. Like they're in concise piles, but they're in concise piles in like various locations of the apartment. So he is great and very supportive of my knitting. <laughs> my favorite thing to do while knitting and what do I watch or listen to while knitting? So I've definitely been engrossed in knitting podcasts on YouTube. I definitely reach for them first when I have a project to work on. A ton of knitters out there on YouTube. Some of my favorites include like Knitty Natty, High Fiber Knits, Knit California, Typical Bliss. Those are just like a few. I have a ton that I follow and watch. I'm always looking for new ones as well. So if you have some favorite knitter podcasters, feel free to let me know in the comments. And once I've watched all of the podcasters on YouTube, and if there's no more to watch, <laughs> um, I will usually put on whatever I'm watching on Netflix, or sometimes I have read while knitting. Like if I get a book on my iPad through the Libby app, I will read while knitting, which is nice. I don't really get Libby books very often or frequently through my iPad just because I tend to want to read the most popular books and they always take forever to like get off the holds and or get off the wait list and actually get the book. So I love to read more while knitting because yeah, reading is fun. <laughs> Okay, the next question, what is your process in deciding what to knit next? What are your knitting inspirations and where do you find them? So I would say most of it comes from Instagram. I'm on my like knitting Instagram account all the time just to see what people are making and a lot of my inspiration comes from that. I will save projects that people post that I have an interest in or know I'll have an interest in in the future. And yeah, I would say 
there's like a ton just on my feed, stories, the explore page. Sometimes the knitting inspiration will come from the pattern itself if I'm really liking the silhouette or style of the knit piece. Other times the inspiration comes from the yarn. I have not been super into hand dyed yarn, but lately I've been following a bunch of hand dyers and I'm definitely getting into them, which is a dangerous game for the wallet, but... <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of really nice hand dyed yarn that would probably inspire knitting projects for me in the future. I would probably buy a colorway if I like it and then figure out a pattern for it after the fact. I also do use Ravelry sometimes to, if I want a knitting project and I know like, oh, I really want a, a turtleneck sweater. I always hop on Ravelry, filter out the sweaters with turtlenecks. If I know what weight yarn I wanna use, you know, DK weight knit turtleneck sweaters and that'll help me find inspiration as well. I also will follow the hashtags of the current projects that I'm working on. So like right now I'm knitting the Monday sweater. I have the Monday sweater hashtag following on my Instagram and that motivates me to work on the project more because I'll see feeds of people working on their Monday sweaters, finishing their Monday, Monday sweaters, and wearing their Monday sweaters. So that is a good way to keep me motivated and inspired to continue knitting. All right, next question. How and when did you learn how to knit? So I learned how to knit when I was in fourth grade. So I think that means I was nine years old and I learned from one of my close childhood friends. She was knitting on the bus. We took the bus to school together and I asked her, I was like, oh, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm knitting. And I was like, can you teach me? I don't know, I just had an immediate draw to her knitting and asked her to teach me. So <laughs> we spent recesses sitting under a tree. She taught me the basic knit stitch. And from there, I kind of just took off with my own knitting journey. I got a bunch of books from the library on knitting. My mom was super supportive. I mean, I was just in like elementary and middle school. So she would go to, or take me to AC Moore and buy yarn. She would get me those like knitting craft kits. I don't know if any of you guys remember those Klutz craft kits. They had them in like all sorts of different crafts and genres and styles and they had a knitting one. So I remember that book pretty vividly. And I use that a lot to learn more than just the knit stitch as well as YouTube videos. But I feel like back then when I was a child, I wasn't on YouTube like very frequently or at all. Um, yeah, the question that I still don't have the answer to is how I learned how to knit left-handed. I don't think my childhood friend knit left-handed, but somehow I like naturally picked up the needles and worked them like from left to right instead of right to left. I don't know. I wish I could go back in time as like a ghost and like see a young me learning how to knit because I don't really know how I learned the left-handedness, especially if I kept learning new stitches from books and such, which probably were teaching in the right-handed style. That's, you know, more widespread. So yeah, I think a lot of my knitting, that was just like basic skills that I learned as a child. And then I sort of took a break when I was in college and high school, I didn't really knit too much. But then after I graduated, I picked up knitting again, got super into garment knitting. And that was like the next level of me learning a ton of different knitting techniques. And by then, you know, that wasn't that long ago. So I use YouTube mostly for everything that I needed to know. <laughs> The next question is how do I manage my scraps? That is also a great question because I don't have a very good system right now. I will usually when I finish like a project and I have leftover yarn, I will rewind the yarn because it usually gets all like loose in the ball when you get to the end of a project. So I'll rewind it so it's in a nice tight center pull ball and I'll usually just put it back in my yarn shelf like with the rest of the yarn. My yarn shelf is loosely organized by like yarn weight. So if I finish a DK weight sweater, I'll put the leftover DK weight yarn back into the DK weight shelf. But I've recently did like an overhaul of my yarn shelf. I kind of want to dedicate the shelf just to sweater quantities of yarn and wouldn't really have space for scraps because it would get pretty messy. So I kind of like nitty natties 
system. I was watching some of her videos from her scrap free 2023 that she's doing this year and she puts a lot of her scraps in big Ziploc bags and they're like separated by weight so like one Ziploc bag is all DK scraps one Ziploc bag is all fingering scraps and she'll have like a weight threshold like I think she said if something is less than 10 grams it goes in a different bag but if it's bigger than that it'll go in the main scrap bag and I think I want to do something like that just so I can over time collect more scraps and then when they're all categorized in the same weight, I can use them in a single project. And I think that's a good way to organize it. I haven't done that yet, so that's in the works. <laughs> when I went through my yarn shelf also, I categorized and put everything into Ravelry, the Ravelry stash option. I had not been using that before, so it took a really long time to literally go through every single ball of yarn I have and put it and catalog it into Ravelry, but I know that'll help me stay organized and then I can digitally sort and look through what I have. So if I'm ever wondering, oh, like how much of that DK yarn do I actually have? It's gonna be all there in Ravelry and it was tough at the beginning to go through it all at once, but now I'm just gonna go through it as I get new yarn, you know, pop it in the Ravelry catalog and it's all sorted there for me. If time wasn't a factor, which pattern would you like to knit multiples of? This one was kind of tough. I had a hard time deciding what I would answer, but I will give a more general answer. I think any sort of scarf or large wrap I would love to knit multiples of, but just the time commitment it takes to make a very large wrapper scarf, and they tend to be, in my mind, a little bit more tedious or than like a sweater project. So like I finished the Cambria wrap and I love that thing. I wear it a lot, it's a really nice fabric. I love how oversized it is. So I would love like another one, especially in a natural fiber because I knit that one in acrylic, but I just don't have the time to redo that whole wrap I also really like the shift cowl that I made and there are a few other patterns by Andrea Maori that are similar to that including a very large wrap I think it's called night shift and I would love to knit that I, I might do it one day but it's just another time crunch or like a fingering weight shawl or wrap I think would be lovely to knit and have multiples of but time time is limiting this question here is as a knitter what do you think about crochet garments the crocheted fabric is so different from knitted fabric especially stretch wise so unfortunately i can't really answer too much about this question i have not knit many crochet garments i've actually only knit two one of them was a summer tank and one of them was a beach cover-up and yeah, I don't have a lot of crochet garment experience, so I don't wanna speak out of turn without having the experience or knowledge. The only thing I can say is that crochet stitches take up more yarn than a knit stitch. So to get like the same size garment, you're gonna use more yarn in a crochet pattern than a knit pattern. And therefore your project might be heavier or denser, which would affect like the drape and the flow of the fabric. And that would be the only difference that I know of right now. I would love to knit, or sorry, I would love to crochet like a crochet raglan sweater and compare that to a knitted raglan sweater. I just haven't done that yet. I don't know if I will, I would love to. We'll see. <laughs> Do you knit socks with circular needles or DPNs? I knit them with circular needles. I use the Chowgu nine inch circulars for my socks and I love them. I am not a fan of DPNs in the round at all. I actually will use Magic Loop instead if I need a smaller circumference that I don't have a circular needle for. Um, I don't know why I don't like DPNs. I just think they're kind of fiddly. I don't like the rotating and like swapping the needle every so often. And I like how circular needles, they just go in the round continuously. I know some people have issues with holding the nine inch circulars. They just hurt their hands a little bit because they're so small. I haven't really encountered that issue with the way I hold the needle, but every knitter is different and has different preferences. Prefer knitting at home or in public? I do most of my knitting at home. I wouldn't say I'm in too many public situations where I would bring my knitting. I'm not like against knitting in public. Um, like I would love to go to a coffee shop and just knit 
in like the morning or something but I don't really like go out in public too often like if I'm out in public I'm gonna be like doing something like getting groceries or running errands so those aren't really opportunities to knit but yeah I would say like 95% of my knitting is done at home Next question is, what needles do I use? Okay, so I grabbed my needle set so I can show you guys. My favorite needles that I use are the Knitter's Pride Nova Platina needles. They are chrome plated metal needles. And let me show you guys here. They have a very sharp tip. They have very long sharp tip. This is an interchangeable set and you can see that I've used them a lot so there's some oxidation and wearing on the tips that like orange coloring um, but they're really smooth the stitches like fly off of them I don't find myself needing to like push my stitches along at all um, it came in this kit here this is actually like I put all my needles in here this is not the full kit but I also have the 16 inch circular edition of that needle set and the only thing I would say about these needles is that the cords are kind of on the cheap side. They're not my favorite cords to use. They're, um, oh, you can't see that at all. Sorry. <laughs> they are like cheaper plastic. And I've had some issues with them. Like they don't uncurl very easily. And occasionally I've had plastic, the plastic cord pop out of the metal housing. Um, so I did buy some extra Knitter's Pride Mindless cords, which are a little bit nicer. They have the swivel housing, so you have less chance of unscrewing. And I'm using them now on this sweater, so you can't really see, but the blue, that's the cord there. And yeah, those are my favorite needles to use. I did recently purchase some Knitter's Pride Dreams needles, which are the ones I'm using right here. These are birch needles so they're wooden and they're really nice but I definitely after using these for a while I definitely have found that I prefer the metal needles so that's my needle set the next question is how much money do you spend on yarn and I was a little scared to answer this question I didn't really want to like look up how much money I've spent on yarn and I didn't really like know what time frame to look for but I would say like every once in a while I'll like splurge on a ton of yarn and then I'll like know that I just splurged so I'll back off and not really buy yarn for a little bit. I would say right now I'm in that phase where I'm not really buying a ton of yarn because I got to go to Sweden and Denmark in December. If you guys saw my like winter knitting plans video I basically did like a yarn haul of everything I got from there and I'm still I'm still working on that yarn for sure. I don't even think I've used like half of it. I use some of it for the Moby sweater. And then this was also like the sweaters quantity yarn that I bought there, the Santa Scarn Sunday. Um, so I looked up that bill and I had spent $500 in Sweden and Denmark on yarn. And that was for about four sweaters quantities worth of yarn plus extra balls that I got like less than sweater quantities for smaller projects. And I would say I tend to spend money on yarn. And I think this applies to other things like my spending pattern is on like opportunity. So like for my trip last year, I knew it was coming up. So I knew I was gonna have the opportunity to buy yarns over there that were either cheaper than what I could get here in the US or yarns that I can't really get here in the US. So that's like an opportunity thing where like I'm not gonna miss that opportunity. So I definitely spent more than like average. Um, just a perspective on cost. I think some people have asked this before in the comments about the cost of yarn over in Europe compared to here in the US. So Santa's Garn, um, I think I got like one ball of Double Sunday for, from Santa's Garn in Sweden for about seven US dollars. From what I've seen here in the US, it retails for about 10 to $11 per ball. Um, I think if you order it from like online retailers in Europe, it is about $7 a ball, but then you have to pay for shipping, which could be anywhere from like $15, $20 if you're shipping from Europe. So that's like some cost perspective of like the money I was saving by buying it over there. Last month I looked at my budget. I think I only spent um, 
$100 on that sweater's quantity of Alifoss Lopi yarn for the Icelandic sweater that I'm going to make. And I found that I will also spend money on yarn for hand dyers because hand dyed collections are limited and you can only buy them once usually. So the good thing with hand dyers is they usually will um, share what colorways are coming up for their sale like well ahead of time. So it gives me time to put aside money and save up for things that I know I want to get. But it's all budgeted for. I used to spend a lot of money on clothing before I started knitting and probably the amount that I would spend on clothing is now transferred to what I spend on yarn. But yeah, every yarn that I buy always has a specific project tied to it. So I'll always have something in mind when I buy yarn. I will, I don't have a habit of ever buying yarn just arbitrarily without any plans. So I think that helps also like everything that I have and purchase has like a main goal in mind and that goal is going to be reached at some point. I like having a yarn stash available for me so I know that I have like I can cast on a project at any time. I don't have to wait for yarn to come in. Everyone's yarn keeping habits are different. I know a lot of people don't like keeping a large stash of yarn and just like buying yarn as they go for the project. So again, just another way everyone has their different preferences. How much time do you spend knitting per month or day? So I don't think I can answer per month, but let's break it down by day. So I do work remotely from home. And if I'm sitting in Zoom meetings, I'll probably be knitting. Like if I'm not hosting a Zoom meeting where I'm presenting, if I'm just in a listening meeting, I will knit. So that does give me some extra like hours during the work day. I always knit after work, like for at least two hours, you know, I'll put on YouTube or TV or if my husband is playing video games on the TV, I'll watch him and knit as well. So that's probably like two to three hours every like work day. And then on the weekends, it is winter time right now, so I don't really go out too much on the weekends. So I would say like if I have an empty Saturday, I might be knitting for like, I don't know, five to six hours, like a whole afternoon or into the evening. Same thing with Friday evenings, I stay up later and knit, so there's definitely a lot of time in my knitting schedule. I don't know what that says about me, <laughs> that I prefer knitting to doing a lot of other things, but it's nice, so I like to get my projects done pretty quickly. So we have one more question. This last question is, do you still get intimidated while looking at patterns or trying new techniques? And yeah, I definitely do. I have never done brioche knitting and it still terrifies me. And I don't know why. I honestly think it's like the way people talk about it being like scary and difficult and therefore I'm scared of it and I think it's difficult, but I know I just need to give it a try and maybe I won't think it's that bad. In terms of new techniques, I think as long as I can find like a helpful YouTube tutorial on a new technique, I don't feel too bad about it. I was very intimidated when I opened up the pattern for the Moby sweater just by the sheer amount of charts that was in the pattern. Um, and then I realized like every size had like a different chart, which is why it was like 20 pages of charts. <laughs> but once I got started knitting it, it became less intimidating and the charts made sense and they just sort of fell into place in my mind of like what was happening when. So yeah, definitely still get intimidated by some knitting things, but I'm always eager to try something new, perhaps maybe in moderation. Like I would never have like multiple whips going on where they're all new techniques or they're all like very difficult in my mind. Like I would do one at a time. I just finished the Moby sweater and I don't think I want to do like a big cabled or mock cable textured sweater for maybe a little while. Like I'll probably have a few stockinette pieces in between and then I'll have the energy again to do something difficult like that. All right, so that brings us to the end of this knit and chat. I hope you guys enjoyed the answers to the questions, getting to know me a little bit better. Again, thank you guys so much for joining in. Let's see how much progress I got on my sweater, by the way. Gotta find the marker. All right, I think I got about like three quarters of an inch of knitting. That much? Not bad. So thank you guys for watching and joining in. I'll see you next time. Bye.